Okay, there he is, all the way from uh, my neighbor, actually, uh, here in Keller, Texas. And, you know, Roberts, you got a lot going on, right? Including your father, and I'll let you share with, you know, during your presentation about what's going on with Bob. But I know a lot's happening. So thank you so much for being with us yesterday and being with us today, because I know you've been in and out of the hospital. Uh, but uh, great to have you. And so, you know, I, we can go back and forth, or if you have something you'd like to share with the group, I'd just love to open that up. So what's on your mind? Awesome. Well, uh, yesterday was phenomenal. So well, well, just first just of great. all, first of all, I didn't really introduce you because there's some people that might not know you. So Robert ah, okay. is the host. I mean, the majority of people know Robert, but we do have some new people on the call. So Robert is the host of the Real Estate Guys radio show, the number one uh, real estate podcast. He's been doing it for 25 years. He has uh, the quarter of a billion dollar uh, Belize Mahogany Bay Village uh, property that's a, a Hilton Hotel that's amazing. He also hosts the Summit at Sea with the most amazing speakers like Robert Kiyosaki. He has a goals retreat that many of you have been part of uh, that's incredible. He's been doing that for 20 plus years. And I could go on and on and on. Uh, but he's my good friend. We met in 1996 or 95. One of those times. Uh, quite serendipitously and have uh, worked together and been great friends ever since. So thank you for being here. Well, thanks for having me. Uh, boy, talk about hard acts to follow. Uh, Greg was awesome. Great way to start. And of course, Jeanette, that was just incredible to Get everybody grounded. I missed that yesterday. I was able to watch most of yesterday uh, from the hospital, but uh, apologize for not having my camera on yesterday. There was a lot going on, and so I'll get that out of the way. Um, my dad, Bob, is in the hospital. Many of you know Bob, the godfather of real estate, and uh, we've um, been dealing with uh, the fact that Bob is a brain tumor. So um, he is very diminished in his capacity at the moment, but um, I've been spending every other night at the hospital. My sister flew in from Bermuda. It's a hard thing to do right now. Uh, and every other night we trade off. And I just heard from him this morning that he's doing even better than he was yesterday. Um, but long-term prognosis is not good. And, you know, he's 85. And some of you were even at his 85th birthday party, which was amazing. And uh, he's just such a vibrant and amazing man. And it's, um, you know, all the emotions that you go through when this ha happens. And right now we're just trying to get to the bottom of really what can be done and, and all that stuff and what does he want. Uh, so appreciate thoughts and prayers there. Um, uh, didn't really want to start on that note, but I know a lot of people have been wondering and it kind of explains yesterday as well. Um, when Les Brown was uh, presenting yesterday, wow. Um, I shared a little bit that with dad and he, he lit up. So uh, his attention span isn't real long right now. You'll get in a conversation with him for two minutes and then he's asleep, but that's just what his body needs. So um, anyway, that's the story. That's why the Godfather's not uh, here with us uh, today. Um, but you know, I, there's a lot of things that were have been covered so far this weekend. And especially for those of you that are new, I mean, I wish we were together in a room uh, because that's big part of the magic of Inner Circle, whether you're in LA or Philly or Dallas or wherever else, Nashville, uh, when we all get together, it's just extraordinary. Um, but there's also a different level of focus and I think mental availability in this format. I mean, I've seen Les Brown speak a dozen times, been uh, fortunate enough to be in the room with him. Um, we actually uh, had him, uh, I interviewed him for an hour and a half on video uh, about six years ago. And just incredible, incredible guy. But yesterday was just phenomenal. So, wow. Talk about inspiration. And so there's a lot we could talk about. You know, one of the things that we've been talking to real estate investors about is just how to navigate the uncertainty we're in. And that's difficult, if not impossible. How do you navigate uncertainty? Uh, and I got to thinking about maybe a broader perspective on that than just what real estate investors are doing. Um, but, you know, if you're a real estate investor, your world has changed. Uh, for many people, uh, their tenants, whether they're commercial tenants or residential tenants, aren't paying the rent, which means you're not paying the mortgage, which is a whole chain of negativity. You know, we have a hotel property that in December, January, and February was doing unbelievably amazing, better than any projection. We were just so excited to share that with our owners 
at the end of the first quarter and then boom, we went from 400 people on campus to nobody in a week. And now we're closed because the borders to the country are closed. And that's just a big change. You know, three of my four businesses have been severely impacted by this. And I'm sure that's true for you too. And so how do we make sense of any of that? Um, some great nuggets yesterday and even this morning. But I thought maybe some, some framework and, and context might help you come out on the other side, whatever that looks like, stronger than before. You know, we went through the 2008 um, mortgage meltdown, like many of you, and it wasn't pretty. And I'll tell you what, it was, um, in hindsight, there was a ton of stuff we missed that we could have done. And I feel this time we are so much better positioned. We're what better positioned because things like the summit, we've got these incredible friends that come and, and share and speak and teach into our lives and the panels that we put together where, you know, people that are, are well known and whose books you've read don't know each other, but get together and talk and brainstorm. And it's just phenomenal. And we've taken a lot of those ideas in the last three or four years and actually taken action at the real estate guys. That's our motto, education for effective action. And so today uh, we are personally and professionally much better prepared for a downturn, for a change, for a market correction, whatever you want to call it. But at the same time, that doesn't mean we're, we're out of it, right? I uh, was talking to Robert Kiyosaki the other morning. He called just to check on, on dad and on us. And, and, you know, we were talking about the fact that this is a market we've been waiting for. When the market goes down in real estate, it creates opportunity. Will there be opportunity on the other side of COVID-19 in real estate? Absolutely. That's a longer discussion. Um, but really, I think what's more interesting is how you prepare mentally for it. And I talk a lot about managing your psychology, right? Uh, I don't have any formal training in that. But I know for me personally, when I do my best is when I can control my thoughts and feelings. And again, some great ideas already. Uh, Todd was, just, was yesterday amazing, right? Just how do you go through losing tens of millions of dollars and then in hindsight being grateful for it? That's a tough one. Now, I have that same experience. And it was tough at the time, but now it was likely the best thing that could have possibly happened. And what that presupposes is that change is a good thing. And yet as humans, we're resistant to, re resistant to change. So there's kind of three ways people approach life. There's optimists. They're optimistic, and that's great, right? You probably, if you know me, you know I'm an optimist. The glass is always half full. In fact, if you look closely, it's a little more than half full. People say it's completely full, half of water, half of air, or in my case, half of, half of beer and half of air. But I'm an optimistic guy. Now, optimism, I'm going to guess, resides on most of your shoulders because you would be spending a weekend like this if you were a dyed-in-the-wool pessimist, right? I mean, the opportunities are for optimists. They don't call them pessitunities. Optimists are the ones that make things happen. So we have, for an optimist, we have an expectation that tomorrow will be better than today. That's our expectation. We're going to be better. The world's going to be better. And we use tips and techniques and strategies like Greg was talking about, like Les talked about yesterday, to put ourselves in that mental space where we're striving for more, to have more, be more, do more, all that. The opposite, obviously, is the pessimist, the person who is down on themselves in the world, and they think tomorrow's going to be terrible. And they're usually right, by the way. Uh, and we won't spend much time there because most of us don't spend a lot of time in pessimism, although we all have those let's huddle in the fetal position moments. Uh, but at the same time, optimists break out of that. But in the middle is a really interesting thing, and I think this is where most people um, reside. And it's also what's happening today, and I think the key to coming out of this stronger. And that is what we call normalcy bias. You've probably heard this thrown around recently, but normalcy bias is the idea that your life is about the same tomorrow as it was today. Tomorrow is going to look like today. If I took the same route to work yesterday, it's going to be the same today. If I leave at the same time, I'm going to get there at the same time. Next week's going to look kind of like this week and next month's going to look kind of like this month. And you know, next year's summer vacation is going to be pretty similar to this year's summer vacation. We might go somewhere else, but we have a good time, right? We have a, a bias towards everything being like it always is. So just for a minute, do you see the difference between expecting everything to remain the same, being optimistic and expecting everything to be better, and being pessimistic and expecting everything to be worse? Now you get to choose your attitude, right? And how you approach life. 
And there's some good things about normalcy. Normalcy gives us things like routine and habit. And a great habit can serve you well. You know, talking about the starting your day and ending your day. Those are habits that can serve you well. We say that a good habit is hard to form and easy to live with. And a bad habit is easy to form and hard to live with. So what routine gives us is the ability to develop habits that serve us. We choose to behave in a certain way because it serves us. Now, people who are pessimistic do that, by the way, as well. They reinforce their negative spiral. And those of us that are optimists want to do everything we can to reinforce our positive spiral. We look at things in a way that give us whatever our bias is. But a lot of folks right now, this normalcy bias slows you down. Kyle and I, uh, many years ago, uh, met an extraordinary woman named Bonnie St. John Dean, and she is a, a medalist, an Olympic, Paralympic medalist a skier, uh, downhill slalom, and she has one leg. And she tells an extraordinary story about this event when she was at the Olympics, and she had this slalom, and the weather was awful, and she fell down in the middle of this race. And she pulled herself together and she got up and she finished the race, but she was kind of, you know, her, her mentality had checked out. Like, I blew it. And, you know, if you watch that, you know, you watch 10 skiers and one falls, if they fall, they're done, right? Well, in hindsight, what she discovered is that every single skier fell on that competition, every single one. And she got up, but she didn't get up the fastest. And the person that got up the fastest got the gold and Bonnie got the bronze. So she still is a medalist and she still did extraordinary, but her thing wasn't about how well she skied, it was about how fast she got up. And this is how we approach change, is how quickly can we adapt to change. So change by nature is uncomfortable. People don't like change, they don't like it. Now you have to be willing to at least consider change to have anything be different in your life, right? If you always do what you've always done, you always get what you've always got, right? The definition of insanity is doing the same thing all the time and expecting things to change, they won't. But as Jim Rohn would say, for things to change, you must change. And so I think right now, during this interesting time in our lives, we can focus on making sure we come out of this embracing change. And it's easy to say, but hard to do. So the first thing is, you have to look for opportunities to change, and then you have to welcome change, be open to change, and then really figure out how change is gonna be on your side. Todd gave some great examples of that, you know, just talking about going down to the minors and being all those things that he said, you know, those changes that seemed so terrible at the time turned out to be some of the best things that happened in life. I watched my friend Ken McElroy go through the last downturn in real estate. And on the way down, as prices are going down, as there are less and less buyers, Kenny and his partner, Ross, bought $300 million worth of real estate. Everyone thought they were crazy. Everyone said, what are you doing? They were many times the only bidder. And guess what? In the light of day, they look brilliant, partially because they are, but partially because they took action when others were scared to. So we're gonna come out of this as people, business owners, entrepreneurs, and there's gonna be opportunity. And those of you that try to hang on to what life used to look like the hardest, you're hanging on to try to wait until everything come back, back, to, nor back to normal, you're not gonna be in the same position as those who realize it's never gonna be the same, right? Air travel's not the same anymore since 9-11. Since everything changed, but it still, we still got from A to B, you know, I'm a guy that spends 120 to 140 days a year on an airplane, and I haven't been on a plane in months, but I will again. It'll be different. So the point is, look for ways to come out of this and be different. Be different in the way you show up and how quickly you take action and looking for opportunities. Don't be hell-bent on life being the same as it was. Maybe you have a great business and it's going well and all of a sudden it's not. Don't just blindly expect it to be like it was before. Right, we had an amazing business and it was just thriving and it was un it was unbelievable. We worked 10 years to get in a position to that we had finally reached, and boom, rug pulled out from under us. So do we just throw up our hands and say, Oh well? Of course not. But at the same time, we're under no delusion that in a month or two, bang, it's gonna be back to normal. 
that's probably not how it's going to happen. Instead, there's going to be a ton of change. Some change is external. The most important change is internal. So the question is, how do you have to change to do the best you can in this new world? So how do you take who you are, that amazing person you are with your experience, both good and bad, with your skills, your talents, marry that to the new change and opportunity coming to create the next best version of you? That's your mission. I don't have the answer because the answers are within you. It's really about you asking the right questions. How can I notice change, be ready for change? How can I advocate for change? Because our business models are gonna change. I mean, here we are normally be in a room together for two days, that would be awesome. But you know, if we had, there'd be several of you that couldn't have made that event. And there'd be some of you that got into great conversations at the hallway at the expense of missing something in the room. And we have those gifts back because we're willing to embrace some change. So that's really what's on my mind in terms of how we navigate this odd time. I would say just that you want to make sure you're not wasting this precious time. If you come out of this having binge watched a bunch of shows, that's, that's one way, right, to spend the lockdown months. But the other way is to really sharpen your ax, right? Come out of this better whether it's just mentally prepared, whether it's the time to get around to things you haven't had time to in the past, those who've been through the goals retreat, go through your goals binder, probably some of those things, maybe B-list goals that you didn't have time for, all of a sudden, we have more time. Some of us have more time. Some of us are more busy than ever. But if you have the time, put the time in now, but manage the way you think about and approach how we come out of this. I know that I did not react as quickly as I could have or should have. So as Jim Rohn would say it, when we come out of this thing, don't wish that you had, but be glad that you did. And that's what I came to say. Awesome, Robert. That was, that was amazing. And I'd like to open it up for questions. And uh, Sean, I know there's a lot of comments if you want to direct any questions. But if you have a question for Robert, unmute yourself and go ahead and ask. And uh, while someone's asking a question, feel free to raise your hand so we know uh, that's the easiest way for us to call upon you. Sean, uh, did you see any questions in the comments? So I know Carla's blowing up our comments with the goals retreat. And by the way, Robert's a phenomenal speaker, as you can tell. Here's the thing. He could do a five-day seminar and not blink just on real estate. I'm not even talking investing. He was number one uh, in the top 1% of real estate before he became an investor. Uh, he puts on massive events. I really didn't even get into his secrets of syndication that he has hundreds of people come. It's not, it's not a cheap event. It's a very high caliber event. If you've ever been, you're meeting some of the best people. And I've met many of you that came through Robert's, uh, group, right? For, I met you on the, the cruise or I met you at goals or, you know, Robert's had me on his podcast a few times. So again, just an amazing community of people he has. So let's uh, go ahead and ask a question if you have one for Robert. Hey, Robert, this is Andrew Hall. Can you hear me? Hey, Andrew, how are you? I'm, I'm doing well. Thanks for asking. Um, as somebody who is a goals expert, when you were having your meeting in January, you probably didn't predict what has happened over the course of this year. How does one make adjustments without necessarily like abolishing goals? Yeah, great question. So one thing about one of the, the, the biggest thing about a goal is it's like a target. We use the metaphor of a target, which is something you're aiming at. And I like a target because it doesn't mean you have to hit right in the middle. You sometimes aim at the middle, but you might hit a little outside, but that lets you refine your aim. And a big part of goal setting is the constant restructuring of your goals. In fact, I talk at the goals event the first night about Les Brown, because he's a guy that didn't have a big belief in goals, and his reasoning is pretty sound. He said, from where I came from, and you heard his story yesterday, I couldn't see into the next neighborhood, let alone could I see myself at the level I am today. So he sometimes cautions that goals can be limiting. If you just set it and forget it, that's true. They can be. We often outgrow our, our goals or, you know, we want to pursue the, living this life that lives beyond us. Love that. So 
it's a constant readjustment. What I suggest in the goal seminar is that you send a weekly appointment with yourself to review your goals and a monthly appointment with your team. And that's whoever that is for you. It could be in a business context or your life partners, vendors you work with, affiliated businesses, and then a quarterly retreat with yourself. And when you do that, you look at your goals, the ones that matter, because some will fall off. But the ones that matter, you look at your goals and you say, okay, how do we do? And knowing what we now know, what do we need to change? And I think today, a lot of what needs to be changed has to do with external circumstances. And so you just face the reality. If I, so I own a restaurant and this is, this isn't hypothetical. I actually do own a restaurant. We've been in business for 25 years and the governor of our state forced us to close our doors many weeks ago and it crippled us. We sent 43 employees home unemployed. Uh, we, you know, it was awful. It was terrible. And frankly, I wasn't sure we'd come out of it. So that's a big change. In that business unit, we have goals. We look at how we did last year and last month and this same time of, of year last year and all those things. And all that goes out the window in something like this. And so that was a big retooling. With today's current circumstance, what do we do? Well, we can just close and pray and hope. Or we can figure out how do we take what we have and use it to do something? And a couple of things came up. First of all, our restaurants in California and the governor allowed for takeout. But they did a really interesting thing. They relaxed the liquor laws in such a way that we could actually send them beer and mixed drinks to go, which we could never do before. And if you know anything about food and beverage, those have high profit margins, a lot higher profit margins than food. And so we weren't able to replace our income or even close to it, but we were able to preserve a profit margin that at least allowed us to pay our employees and some of our overhead. At the same time, we have a gentleman that lives in the building above us who works for the governor. And he told us about a program that they were looking at to create and prepare meals for elderly people that couldn't get out of their homes. And we took on the opportunity to make three or 4,000 meals a day, which is really we're doing it to support the community. At the end of the day, it's not grossly profitable, except that it does get people to work and it does get business to our vendors and all those kinds of things. So it's a major change. So we say that a bend in the road is not the end of the road unless you fail to make the turn. And right now, a lot of us in our businesses are seeing tremendous hairpin turns in the road. Things are changing. And we can either just keep going straight and you know how that works, or you can navigate the turn. So I think it is just a constant, what we call plan, do, review, right? You plan it, you do it, and you review it, and you just got to review more often today. Awesome answer. Who else has a question for Robert? We've got about six more minutes uh, Sophia before asked, Colonel Tim Cole uh, share. So who, who else? Sophia asked, Robert, is there any plans for possibly a virtual 2021 goals retreat? Yeah. Wow. So that's a, that's a good question. It's, a, it's very experiential, yeah. Yeah. right? So we, we did our syndication event virtually converted to a virtual event uh, with much trepidation and being new to all of this and it turned out great. And it actually ended up being our biggest event and uh, syndication event. And we're embracing virtual reality, if you will, um, at the same time, it's so experiential. Um, we will not let the goals retreat not happen. So if we're not all able to get together in a room, it's probably going to be in some virtual format. Uh, I've got to think through that a lot. Those of you that have been know it's not like a seminar. So, but one way or the other, we'll we'll figure out how to, you know, the show must go on as we keep saying. Um, but uh, our plan is to be in Lake Las Vegas, Nevada, uh, the 8th through 10th of January for annual two and a half day goals retreat. If we can't be there, we'll, we'll figure out a way to do it. Sean, is there a, a real estate investing type yes. question? Yes, Sepp asks, Robert, can you elaborate a little bit more on going through the 2008 that helped you prepare mentally for this particular crash? Sepp. Yeah, so most of it's the hindsight, right? You look back at the things, the mistakes you made, if you will. And I think part of it is we had built up a lot of our personal investment philosophy and the strategies we're implementing on um, particular market conditions and specific markets. And when it all changed, frankly, we just didn't know what to do. I mean, there were some things and we helped shepherd folks through that. And we, you know, didn't just put our heads in the sand, but I don't think we reacted as quickly. So, you know, 
for instance, today, lenders are, um, many lenders are agreeing to forbearance, meaning they will let you pause your payments and tack those on the end of your mortgage. There's reasons to do that and there's reasons not to do that and that would be a longer discussion. But when those tools were available, sometimes we didn't react soon enough. It's like the people that tried to get those PPP loans and then all the money was gone. If you didn't react quickly, well, you were out for the first round. And then maybe you made it the second round and maybe you didn't. So it's back to how quickly you get up. I think the things we learned was it wasn't coming back. I think we kept thinking, well, as soon as we get through this couple of years, it's going to be just like it was. Instead, we had to change completely what we did, which ended up being a better thing. I'm a very different investor today than I was back then. And, and that's just having gone through it. So part of it is you have to go through it. But the great news is you can't be learn I told Kyle people. already that I have to teach a class. So I said I Hold on. Uh, we need to mute someone. I got it. Okay, great. Sorry, Robert. All good. That, that's about the answer. <laughs> well, hey, uh, on that note, how can people get a hold of you? If they want to well, we're at realestateguysradio.com. That's the easiest place. That's our podcast. It's free, and uh, we do it every week. Uh, right now, a lot of great stuff happening. We're putting together a really interesting event called our COVID crisis uh, investing webinar. How do you invest in the middle of a crisis? And it's obviously you know spurred by coronavirus, but really, I think it'll be more timeless than that. Um, but the who's who, I mean, pretty much everyone that you've ever said, hey, Robert said this person on their show, we're reaching out to to be part of this webinar. It's gonna be fantastic. We've already recorded several of the interviews and there's a lot more coming this week. It's probably three or four weeks from coming out yet, but if you sent an email to crisis at realestateguysradio.com, uh, it's gonna be free. You can, um, it's gonna be long, but if you're interested in investing and if you're interested in what really smart people have to say about it, then uh, that would be a good thing, uh, thing to do. So I'm, I'm going to have you say it real slow. What's the URL and what's the email address? Yes. So the Hello. URL is, it's real estate. We're the real estate guys. So realestateguysradio.com, realestateguysradio.com. And if you're interested in the crisis webinar, then you just send an email to crisis at realestateguysradio.com. And you'll be put on the list. So when it's available, uh, you'll be able to watch that. And, uh, and for your podcast, you have thousands archived and you've interviewed massively huge names. And so again, podcast has the same name, right? They can just go find you on iTunes or go to your website and click on an episode as well. Sure. However you listen to podcasts, uh, we're pretty easy to find. But if you type in real estate, I'm going to guess you're going to find us. But if you type in the real estate guys, then you'll definitely will. <laughs> hey, uh, prayers to Bob. You know, he's been in our, our thoughts and prayers every day, as have you and Kara and the kids and the whole family. So thank you for jumping on today. When you see Bob, you know, just give, give, give him our love and, uh, and our prayers. And thanks so much for being with us today, my friend. Thank you for that. Thanks, everybody. Love you, brother.